And normally, pre-stress concretes are you know classified into two methods. One is pre-tensioning, and another one is post-tensioning. Again, I am into a post-tensioning. This PPT will concentrate more on post-tensioning. Uh, so yes, so this is a uh, pre and post-tensioning. Uh, as you see, the first image represents the pre-tensioning, and the second image represents about the post-tensioning. So pre-tensioning is nothing but you you induce or you stress the tendons. I, I'll I'll tell you what a tendon is. So uh, you know on the further PPT, you'll you'll induce the stress before uh, pouring the concrete. And whereas in the case of post-tensioning, you would uh, you know give the tension to the tendons after you uh, pour the concrete. Um, so this is uh, again uh, pre-tensioned elements are often pre-cast in a factory and shipped to a site. That's true because uh, normally pre-tensioning uh, they I mean they do it in a factory because inside I mean uh, if you have to cast in a site, post-tensioning is what normally preferred. Uh, let's say if you are gonna cast like uh, some 20 meters or even let's say 50 meters uh, huge spans or slabs or uh, you know beams, uh, post-tensioning would be preferred. Whereas in the case of pre-tensioning. Uh, let's say uh, if you're constructing a bridge uh, where you can't actually over a river where you can't actually you know do the uh, tensioning normally they would do in a factory and uh, you know uh, construct the bridge uh, i'll show you the image uh, of the same uh, again sorry yes so post tensioning uh, the red thing uh, the red thing uh, represents the tendons as you could see, it's it, it's not of a straight; it's more of a curved. Uh, the drape configuration are much more common than the main tendons. Again, the post tensioning can take on any profile. I mean, it not necessarily have to be in this way. It could be, you know, different shapes. Uh, you see, uh, you know, up downs and up downs, or even straight profile. Straight profile in the sense below the CG. It's always preferred to be below the center of gravity, and the both the ends uh, should be at the center of gravity. Both the ends, in the in the sense, the the stressing end and the dead end, or uh, either of them could be a stressing end, or both of them could be a stressing end. Again, we you see a, a brief on the pre-tensioning. Uh, again, guys, it, it will be more of an image. As I won't bore you with the uh, theory and uh, your uh, uh, type text. It will be more of an image. Uh, so pre-tensioning. Uh, so this this is the strand uh, that you see. That's uh, that will be tension. Again, uh, uh, as you could see, the strands, again, they, there is no concrete over here. There is only strands. This is also the strands, but it's after tensioning. See, as I said, uh, the strands will be tensioned uh, before you pour the concrete. Again, pre either in case of pre-tensioning or post-tensioning, similar to your RC, it requires reinforcements. So reinforcements are installed once after the strands have been tensioned. Uh, again, the assemblies are assemblies are getting done. Uh, here the forms here the form size is uh, set. So now we pour the concrete because it's a pre-tensioning. Once after the once after you stress your tendons, once after you you know get rid of your reinforcement, you pour the concrete. Then the curing part happens. And again, if you notice, this is not happening in the site. This is actually happening in a factory. So now uh, the girder has been removed from the casting bed. As you could see now, uh, from once, the, once it is done in the factory, the print tensioning process again, it's been transported. Uh, that's the girder is moved to the storage. Now, from the storage, it's been moved into the job site. Again, the job is done. As you can see, the the, the girder, it, it, this was cast in the factory, uh, pre-tensioned, then uh, curing process was done, uh, then it was transported, then uh, it was constructed. As you can see, this was a bridge. Now we'll come to the post-tensioning. Here in the post tensioning, as you could see, those white, uh, those white color which is passing through, uh, you know, uh, the thing that is called as tendons. Uh, here also, uh, those blue, blue color thing, those are tendons. So here, uh, only after the concrete is poured, the tendons will be stressed. 
these white color thing that you see these are called as ducts and again post tension there are of two types which i'll explain in the, on later slides one is the bonded type another one is the unbonded type the ones that you are seeing now is the bonded type uh, here you cannot actually see an individual tendon passing uh, those tendons will be you know wrapped up with those duct uh, these are called as duct uh, only after that the concrete is poured over the duct so there is no direct contact between the poured concrete and the tendons uh, so this is a completed uh, post tension building again uh, earlier it was a post tension slab uh, now it is uh, we are seeing a beam again uh, let me make myself clear the post tensioning or pre tensioning can be only done for horizontal members in most cases it should be beam or the slabs here as you could see the the blue thing that is passing over is a tendon or uh, surrounding it with a reinforcement uh, this the mono and the multi strands uh let me be uh okay mono and multi strand mono strands are generally used for you know uh both mono and multi can be used for a beam uh if if there is you know less requirement if there is a less uh if the loads are comparatively less or if the beam sizes are comparatively less you can go with the mono strands else you would have to go with the multi strands again uh the stressing on the stressing thing is happening Uh, on the left side, there you could see the the person is stressing a mono strand. On the right side, you, you could see the person is stressing the multi strands. Uh, this is how the strands are anchored. This is a strand tendon. Next, yes. So this is uh, I mean this image represents uh, how uh, a tendon is actually you know how. Um, uh, what i what i could say like how the actual thing looks uh, as you could see the concrete again the white color thing no? i told you right that was a duct then that is a strand then anchor uh, on the right side as you see the anchor that is cast on the concrete this is how uh, a post tension member would look yeah this is uh, there are two types of post tensioning as i have told before one is a bonded another one is a unbonded system mostly mostly people would go with the bonded system or more in the projects which i have i have worked 99% i worked only the bonded system uh, i'll tell you the advantages and disadvantages of these two systems uh, one major differential factor is uh, once the you know uh, that uh, duct uh, you no know, the tendons are inserted into a duct uh, whereas there is no duct in the unbonded system inside there will be a cement grout in the bonded system whereas in the case of unbonded system there won't be any such grout instead there will be only coating of grease yes this is the bonded tendons and as you can see on the uh, top right image there are uh, strands those three things that was coming out as strands again um, you know the term a proper term to describe this would be 3s what we tell just in case to, the way you wish to communicate the structural engineer would be this would take 3s 3s uh, means three strands uh, again it was it's a hole by uh, wedge grips then by anchor block that grout vent is actually in order to pour the cement grout you know you could see two grout vents uh, you know why because first uh, you know dust will be removed by blowing an air blowing of air then a, a cement grout will be poured into one of the openings and will be the other openings will be sealed and as you could see one end is the stressing end and the other one is a dead end on the stressing end the tendons will be stressed and in some cases both the ends needs to be stressed uh, uh, if if it goes like beyond 20 meters or 30 meters then both end needs to be stressed Mm. and on the bottom images you could see the duct those ducts are running through once you once you see the image you will be easily i mean you can easily differentiate whether it's a bonded or unbonded there are ducts then it's a bonded system and on the bottom right uh, that's a real life image of uh, what you what are you seeing in the top right uh, again you could see the dead end again you could see the anchorage and other things 
then we comes to unbounded tendons unbounded tendons okay first you see the bottom left image you cannot find any duct uh, duct pipe over there because uh, each tendon will be individually stressed and you know uh, uh, if you could see the top uh, right image you could see the unbounded post tension it will be much simpler representation you know comparing to the bounded post tensioning systems uh, then uh, bottom second image would be a representation of how the grease application that i've told you right the, uh, uh, that represent that and on the last image that is the bottom right image you could see the unbounded tendons which are ready for you know uh, construction so these are the major differences between bonded and unbonded and this uh, uh, this is bonded and unbonded see generally if you ask uh, i mean if you come and if you go and ask uh, like without a tech if you don't need a technical or a, from a client perspective what they believe is unbonded system are cheaper bonded system are costlier that's what a client would say because again they need a uh, they need the building to be completed that's it but uh, now structurally speaking bonded systems develop higher ultimate flexural strength and doesn't depend on the anchorage after grouting so i mean as you can see the uh, the those three years or the four years will be uh, into a single duct so it doesn't have to you know depend on the anchorage after grouting and it localizes the effects of damage whereas in the case of unbonded system provides a uh, greater lever arm and reduces friction losses and there are losses in the post and pre cast concrete which i'll tell you later and simplifies the you know, fabrication of tendons grouting again not required so that will save your cost again again it can be constructed faster because you don't need a duct or a thing like that generally cheaper and just the last thing is what most of the clients are considered but bonded system is actually you know provides higher uh, flexural strength again uh, this uh, represents the uh, grouting process i told you right one is the vent another one is the grout in grout in is, is on the right side and then that's the vent where you, you know pour the cement grout in uh next uh, this is how the strands are anchored again on the end this is how the strands are anchored okay you could see those are uh, multi uh, these are not 3s or 4s and this is what 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 12 13 14. this is 15s as you could see if we could count uh, that is 15s 15 strands in a single tendon uh next theoretically speaking or uh, more uh, structurally speaking uh this is a structural effects of pre stressing this stands true for both pre and post tensioning uh so what this image generally represent this uh, next one right these two what it generally tells us the tension here is lower so that uh you would require a, you know the significance of these two images is the tension here is ready so that you would require a low number of uh, reinforcement rebars or in other words again uh, this is again a normal image this is how easily can a pre stressing be explained if you google up the post tension concrete or pre stressed concrete this is uh, uh, you know diagrammatic explanation a simple explanation again, a pre stressed concrete is a compressive stress being induced by the high strength steel tendons in the concrete member before the loads are applied again that's why it's called as pre stressed before the service you are applying a load then this would balance the stress imposed in the member during the service then first image represents a, a tendon that is without load without tension next without with load and without tension as you could see the deflection next is without load with tension once you have applied the tension uh, there would be a minimal upward deflection though it won't be you know appear to your uh, it won't be appear to your naked eyes but uh, this is of the pre stressing or post tension concrete works now once after the loads have been applied and with tension you, you could achieve the equilibrium next as i said there are a uh, losses in pre stress uh, even during the pre stressing the tendons the transfer of the pre stress to the concrete member there is a drop of pre stressing force from the recorded value 
uh, and the jack gauge generally the losses are classified into two major groups one is the immediate the other one is the time dependent again time dependent losses are common for the rcm members too right it would be creme there would be uh, sorry there would be creep and there would be shrinkage the relaxation uh, losses is more of specific to uh, pre stress concrete first if you come to the immediate uh, loss there will be elastic shortening and there will be a losses due to friction and there will be a losses due to anchorage again guys just imagine once you are you know putting a lot of stress inside the concrete once you have uh, cut cut the force you have to cut the stress that there will be losses the tendons will be like this once you cut the force there will be some loosening happens or some loss would generally happen just imagine a rubber band once you put tight and once you leave it there will be some kind of losses something i mean there will be friction there will be anchorage slip the time dependent losses these time dependent losses would take uh, years to happen and for these elastic shortening friction and anchorage slip for uh, each losses there are separate calculations to be made in order to for a efficient design so overall the pre stress concrete you know efficient use of materials i mean uh, let's say you, you can uh, what a less number of rebars the uh, concrete is maintained in compression you can control the cracks uh, next a uh, smaller deflection thinner members I, i would say let's say if you rc if uh, again on rough example i can give is if rc if the, let's say if you require a, a 230 mm of slab thickness post tension if you do the same slab in post tension again this is a rough example you could possibly get uh, you know 180 mm okay why 180 mm the number because 180 mm is the minimum size uh, if you are going to, with a post tensioning if you are planning to do the post tensioning again you can achieve the longer spans then corrosion resistance why corrosion resistance again uh, you know less number of reinforcement again your uh, your tendons will be covered in a duct again less material so less materials is directly proportional to reduced environmental impact so why pt instead of rc there i have kept an asterisk that is because the conditions are play because you cannot go all, all, all of the rc structures with pt let's say your house or uh, your apartment where generally where the pt is used is where uh, a span a span in the sense a column to column distance uh, once it uh, it crosses more than 8 meters or you know in some cases where it crosses more than 10 meters or or single span single span in distance you could have columns whether it's a long span like i have i have designed like 130 meters single span i mean you you would have columns but the overall it's like 130 150 meters in that case rcc won't work you have to, you should go with the pt uh one of the advantages again there there is a i mean you could debate with me that going on pt will uh, will make the overall project cost higher that's again debatable i'll tell you why let's say if you are uh, constructing a building where you where only two of your beams or three beams or only one slab of yours is going more than 8 meter or more than you know 10 meter you would have to go with the pt pt post tensioning in that case if you compare with the the parallel rc beams or rc slabs you i mean you could uh, possibly highlight the cost whereas let's imagine in this way if you are going if you are constructing a complex or if you are constructing a apartment like some crazy 30 40 floors in that case the beams uh, the the, uh, the floor to floor heights are restricted right so you, you can like 3 to 4 meters is what uh, normally would a floor to floor height in that case in each floor uh, let's say the rc beam depth is uh, what 400 meter uh, 400 400 mm um, whereas in the pt uh you can achieve it by let, uh, roughly roughly i could say you can save like 100 or 150 then do the math for the for the 40 stories how much you can uh save you can actually build a additional 2 to 3 stories in which you can gain the cost back or in other cases like you are building a stadiums or uh, halls you have to go with pt 
in order to reduce the oh again guys if you have uh, like let's say if you are if, if your thickness is overall redu- uh, reducing from like 500 to 350 and overall structure the dead way, the dead load of the entire building will be reduced and overall by using pt you you can attain your full potential of your uh, uh, you know again it's a reinforced concrete plus tendons you can uh, attain the full potential of your concrete strength it won't crack as easily as your rc structure no, so that's why you have to i mean i cannot say you have to go with pt that's why pt is preferred over rc in many of the areas so again, if you ask me, what is the job of a PT structural engineer? There is actual difference, a lot of difference between a RCC structural engineer, PT structural engineer, and once you're a structural engineer, you can go with PT, RC, or steel. These are the three major divisions where a structural engineer would work. So the job would be, I'll tell you, wait. Sorry. So what we do is first, our customers, uh, they are normally uh, what, what we call uh, clients are mostly of either contractor or architect or a structural engineer. Here, the structural engineer, I mean the RC structural engineer. Once uh, he has to, uh, you know, decided uh, the column placements uh, and the overall, uh, what I get, overall plan, the column placement, the beams and the columns and the slabs. Uh, we will we'll get the drawing. If it's from the architect, we will be only getting the column placement or a CAD drawing. Normally, we will get the CAD drawing. If it's uh, of a complex structure, we would uh, insist for a structural drawing. Structural drawing in the sense it's uh, E-tabs or uh, Strat Pro. And nowadays, guys, Strat Pro, we are getting only if like two out of 10 drawings or two out of 20 drawings is uh, is coming in Strat Pro. Majorly, we are getting only in ETABs. So we'd get them. So we'd analyze the input, either it's a CAD drawing or a SAD or ETABs. Then we choose the type of slab. Type of slab in the sense there are some you know, ribbed or a waffle slab or normal PT slab. Then we fix which needs main we decide which needs to be PT and which needs to be RC. If, if uh, normally, if the, again, uh, as I have told, uh, if the span is more than eight meter or 10 meter, we would go with PT or uh, again, a, a same for the slabs or it's, let's say if it is in the case of heavy, heavy loading structure, we would go with the PT. Then we would choose the grade of the concrete again, uh, grade of the concrete for a pre-stress concrete should be M35 uh, minimum. That's what we follow in our uh, uh, work. Then we'll fix the beam sizes. We will choose the type of slab and the slab size. Slab size in the sense thickness of the slab, whereas in the case of beam, we choose B into D. That is the both uh, breadth and the depth. Then we we'll choose the grade of uh, sorry, as I have told, grade of grade of concrete size. Then we would design again for this design. You cannot design a PT in your STAD or ETAP. There are some specific softwares for that. Then we would check if it is if the design passes. Then we would pass on the design to a detailer. Detailer is a person who detailer or a draft man is a person who works only with the CAD so, or AutoCAD or draft site. Again, AutoCAD softwares. Then once after the drawing is completed, we'll pass on the drawing which uh, again, major uh, which uh, i mean pass on the drawing to the to our clients the drawing is like majorly what uh, the drawing would say is grade of concrete again uh, uh, grade of uh, steel grade of steel should be at 500 uh, sizes of the each member thickness of the beam and the slabs then how many tendons is needed? Let's say mono or multi. If it's mono, 3S, 4S, or 5S. And that S stands for strands. Again, once after it's done, we may, or in most of the cases, we'll be getting for a revision. A revision for what again? We'd get revision, let's say, if it can be done like 20 mm, you know, thinner, if it can be, let's say, if I have designed for a 220, can it be made 210? The counter grade won't be a problem. If we receive such thing like that, we'd uh, have to again run the design in our software. So you check if it passes or not. Then you, 
you would uh, send them again the final drawing. So that's a job of a PT structural engineer. Uh, this is what I was talking about. Uh, these are the software which you might probably haven't heard, I guess, at least till now, because uh, even during my masters, I don't know about these software that they exist because they are, I mean, uh, they are exclusively for post engineering. As you could see, those PT uh, by the end of the names in place for the post engineering. First software is a wrapped. Next is adapt. You you might have probably heard of Safe, right? Because Safe is uh, again developed by this same uh, organization who developed ETAPS. Then again, uh, Stat and ETAPS, uh, you must be familiar with it. Wrapped. Uh, the major difference between the wrap and the adapt is, uh, as you could see, that's a screenshot from the wrap software. Um, there. Uh, <coughs> Uh, that uh, you could see the, uh, it's a 2D, it's a 2D software. In the simple words, it's 2D software. You can see the column placements, you could see the thickness, and on the other, uh, you, you can uh, you have to input the loads, you have to input the grades of the concrete, you have to input all the other specifications like uh, column, the drop panel, in case if you are designing a flat slab, again, okay. yes, this is they are designing a flat slab over here. Uh, again, the next software which I was talking about is Adapt. Excuse me. So again, okay, adapt. Adapt is more of a 3D uh, software. It's a 3D representation. Again, uh, for example, I can say, see, eTabs is more of a 3D representation. Uh, again, uh, persons can understand who have worked with the eTabs, I guess. So more or like the same. Adapt is more of a 3D software. Again, you can actually model the entire slab, entire horizontal members with the columns. You can. Adapt, uh, you could see uh, the modeling can happen, whereas in case of RAP, only 2D modeling is possible. The safe software, again, guys, safe, uh, safe is my favorite because, uh, because you can learn it easily. Uh, I, I, it just took like two to three days for me to learn the safe, uh, to model an entire slab. Safe is majorly used in the PT. Again, you cannot uh, put it, uh, you can actually probably, there are some options to, for attendance uh, in the safe, but uh, we don't normally model the post tensioning slab in the safe. What we do majorly using the safe software is we model only the slab, that simple RCC slab. Uh, we would, uh, once after the analysis, it's morely used for uh, getting the behavior of the slab. Why the behavior, if you ask, again, it's again kind of complex because this presentation is morely concentrated on basics of post tensioning. Again, I'll tell you this, just, uh, you know, grasp it like, a, take it like a pinch of salt. Uh, in RCC, uh, generally on the slab, there are two way. Uh, you'd see the, there are main reinforcement and secondary reinforcement. In post-tensioning slabs, it's, uh, it's opposite. They, there are also main tendons and secondary tendons. Here, the main tendons mostly is on the longer direction. Secondary tendons is, on the shorter direction again this not necessarily have to be true for every two you know uh every uh, pt slabs uh, so in order to uh, get which is uh, main direction which is a secondary direction we use the safe again these are the types of slabs which i was talking about uh, one is a flat slab, another one is a flat plate. As you could see, the you know the image uh, depicts it more clearly. In the flat slab, you could see the drop, whereas in the pl uh, flat plate, there won't be a drop. That's the only differentiating factor uh, when it comes, you know, uh, what's the difference between the flat slab and the flat plate? Uh, next, guys, this is uh, an important uh, factor or uh, check. Punching shear check is one of the most important checks to be done. In a case, if you are designing a post tensioning slab, I'll tell you why. I believe, uh, I don't know, uh, you're, you're final years, right? So you will be uh, doing a project. Uh, let's say if you're, most people would be doing a co concrete or a material projects. If you uh, plan to do uh, what cubes and, you know, cylinder specimens, let's say if you're, doing it for a M30 or a M35 or M40, whatever be the greatest. If, you're, if your design 
mix is proper, uh, let's say if you have done your mix uh, theoretically and practically proper, at the end of 28th day, if you are uh, testing your M30 specimen, uh, cube specimen for the compression, you should be getting more than 30, not less than 30 for sure. You should be getting more than 30. So that's how the design works. So in all of the cases, in all the design cases, let's be, let's take a theoretically or in the software, the loads will be always overestimated. That's why we add a factor of safety like 1.5 and load combinations like 1.2, 1.5. Depends on IS456. Again, we always underestimate the st strength of the concrete as well as the speed. So on the end, overall, even if something you know happens, you know, there won't be nothing happens because we are largely overestimating the loads and we have 0 0.6 and 0 0.4, we are uh, underestimating the concrete. Same case with the steel too, we are underestimate strength of the steel or the concrete. Mostly your structure won't fail due to the these things, but punching shear is critical. That's why I have to explain those things uh, in order to explain the importance of the punching shear check. Uh, let me tell you. Let's say this is the slab and your, your column is like this. If there is more load, uh, and usually guys in PT, the span length will be like more eight meters, 10 meters. Once the load is more, once your slab, slab is so much thin, your, your drop thickness is not satisfied. If it fails by punching shear, this column would come up like this. I can imagine all column coming up, all columns coming up like this. What would happen is if your structure fails by punching shear, this is how your structure would look. I mean, this that would be a devastating, it's a disastrous failure as punching shear. So that no PT structural engineer or no RC, no structural engineer would compromise on a punching shear uh, failure. Punching shear will always be checked and uh, and yeah, no no one would like easily go with the punching shear without checking them. Again, let's coming back to the punching shear. This failure is occurred due to shear, that's why it's named. In flat slab structure, this occurs at a column support joint. Again, as I've demonstrated with this, with the minimal setup, uh, the column will protrude, your slab will fail there wouldn't be a structure after the punching shear failure happens. Then this type of failure is critical as I had said, because no visible signs are shown prior to the failure. You won't get any visible sign. If the punching shear fail happened, as I had said, it would be disastrous. Imagine, again, as I've told post-tensioning, they do only for the big, big structures, huge structures. Imagine a slab of 30 or 20 meters fails due to punching shear, there would be fatalities, there'll be things you, which you can't imagine. That's why the punching, again, how we can overcome the punching shear? First, uh, you have to, by increasing the drop thickness, by increasing the, you know, uh, thickness of the slab. Uh, this is in case of a uh, flat slab, whereas in the case of flat plate, where there is no drop, if you have to overcome the punching shear check, you would have to introduce something called column column capital. Again, it it does it may or uh, what I can say it may look similar to a drop, but it's kind of different from what is a drop. And uh, these drop specification, the design of these uh, column drops is again based on IS four five six. Then, guys, uh, we come to this ribbed slab uh, again. This is how a rib slab would look because uh, you you might have probably seen these rib slabs in your uh, shopping malls parking area probably uh, as you could, uh, the car parks below floors uh, reduces the dead weight and increases the efficiency of the concrete section. And the other type of uh, this would be waffle slab. This you might have probably seen. I don't remember the hotel name uh, in some of one of the star hotels in or. I know more than one might have probably used. And Chennai's uh, used these kind of waffle, waffle slabs. 
this is a two way joy slab again uh, made of reinforcement concrete uh, the name of waffle comes because uh, the grid pattern created by the reinforcing ribs that's why the name of waffle slabs uh, so these were the type of slabs normally so now we see to the construction sequence of the post tensioning so post tensioning this is how uh, so, uh, you know finished structural drawing would look uh, for the flat slab again guys this is a flat slab as you could see those are the drops on uh, each column again the, those yellow lines are the uh, drops you cannot probably see the columns because those grid lines was actually those hiding those columns in those drawings this is how a completed structural drawing of a flat slab would look. Uh, this is a real-time site uh, image. The bottom shattering is done first, followed by uh, wait, the then the bottom shattering is completed. This is a PT flat slab reinforcement drawing. Again, these are the works that are to be, uh, I mean, that is done by the detailers or the draftsman, which, uh, which I was talking about. This is a time of bottom nominal reinforcement. This is a bottom, once after the bottom nominal reinforcements are done, this is how uh, the real life image would look. Again, this is the drawing of tendon layers. Uh, this is how uh, the output goes to the construction site from our side, that is from a PT structural engineer's office to construction site. Uh, only 2D diagrams would go to them. Uh, as you could see, these are the drawings for tendon layout, indicating the post strip and the stressing ends. Stressing ends in the sense which end is to be stressed and which ends are to be marked as dead end, or in some cases, both could be stressed. Uh, in the case of post strips, let's say if the structure is more than, again, if the, not the structure, the span. So if the span is more than like 30 or 40 meters, you would require a post strip. Post strip is nothing but in between the tendons needs to be st stressed. This is a bonded type again, bonded uh, post tensioning. So this is a fixing of ducts at the end of stressed anchorages. Inside the ducts would be those tendons which I was talking about. Uh, stre stressing and anchorage is fixed at the end, edge of RCC beams. Here the beams are of RCC and the slabs is of PT. Tension. Now those strands would actually normally look like this. It will be rolled like you know tape and it will be brought to the site. Later it will be straightened. Then these are cut for the desired length or required length. Then inserting of those strands into the GI ducts is happening. Uh, this is our sharp drawing of uh, tendon layout profile looks in AutoCAD. Uh, now, once after the fixing of bars, uh, the tendon profile is done. Again, as I have said, those tendons could be straight or you know draped. Uh, in that, those uh, adjustments are done using the those reinforcement that you could see in the bottom of those ducts. Next, the stressing and anchorage, grout vents, and completion of laying. So the stressing part happens here. As you could see, this is how the busting links of the stressing anchorage would look. This is anchorage. The left image uh, depicts uh, anchorage at the slab edge, and the right depicts uh, anchorage at the edge of the beam. Again, on a short note for the busting reinforcements, imagine you you are, you are applying a force at the end of the you know, anchorage part where the concrete needs to be you know without in order to avoid a busting of the concrete what if you provide a reinforcement that is called as busting reinforcement in a simple words uh, the fixing of dead ends again this is a dead end uh, dead ends in the sense I mean the stressing won't happen in this end uh, this is the laying of tendons and completion uh, post strip uh, again the post strip which I was talking about earlier the post strips are provided for the construction feasibility um, this is uh, uh, again this uh, this image you can see the tendons the ducts 
uh, the edge part, uh, how the vents for uh, you know grout. Uh, you could see all those uh, things in the single image. This is an aerial view. That's a bird's eye view of a tendon laying before concreting. This is a PT slab after completion of tendon laying before concreting. This is a PT tendon laying in a beam. Again, here the P yeah, the post tension beam construction is happening. Again, the concreting part is happening here, right after the placements of tendons. Now, the blocks are to the stressing end, as you can see the at the stressing anchorage. Now, the fixing of anchor blocks and bridges is happening. So, since it's a post tensioning, only after the concrete, for, you pour the concrete and it's here, you do the tensioning part. So now the stressing of the slab tendons happen. Then once after it's completed, so this is how it, it looked like after the stressing of in the edge beams. Then excessive strands have been cut after stressing. Again, these holes will be shut with the cement. Yeah, as you could see, patching, patching of the stressing pockets. So once after it's done, it will look like a normal structure. There won't be any visible holes or there will be any visible pockets. So the closing of the grout hose end is happening here. Uh, yeah, so the, this is how a post-tensioning process would look on the site. Uh, so this is, guys, this is nothing but a cycle time of concrete plan for 10 days. It's a real time, this is, for, uh, this is how a real time Again, if you if you any of the people are interested in pursuing M Tech or Masters in Construction Management, this is for you people. Uh, so yeah, so fine. So uh, the, my post tensioning, you know, the, you know, structurally speaking, my post tensioning presentation is done with this. So this is how our post tensioning happen again. For, to give you a gist, why it is called as pre-stress concrete because you are inducing the stress before service. That's why it's called as pre-stress concrete. In that, there are two types, pre-tensioning and post-tensioning. Pre-tensioning is because you are stressing the tendons before pouring the concrete. Post-tensioning because you are, you are inducing the tension after you pour the concrete. Again, pre-stress pre is commonly used, whereas if you have to if you're planning to I mean, make your structure inside a factory, post-tensioning, you can do it on the site. Normally, for the big structures, post-tensioning is preferred. And in post-tensioning, there are two types. One is the bonded and unbonded. Again, unbonded is comparatively cheaper. Structurally speaking, bonded tendons are more stronger. Uh, again, precious concrete can be done only for the horizontal members beams and slabs so that ends my post tensioning pre presentation so guys this is something more important than the post tensioning presentation which i have done uh, again uh, i believe you are the final year students uh, to have a goal after you do your uh, UG because i was sitting uh, in your seat like three years or four years back and I have been the similar kind of presentation. So once after a UG, do fix your goal, whether you're going to do a master's, whether you're going to get into a business or whether you're going to do a dark job, you get your goals right. This particular slide is important than those of the previous on like 40, 50 plus slides uh, uh, um, to keep your goals. I mean, do, uh, do have a clear idea what, what you're going to do once after the completion of UG. Yes, and uh, if you are, you know, let it be a business or a master's here in India or an abroad, uh, make, I mean, start preparing for that because time will go run fast. I won't say uh, there was, I mean, I would, if I say that there was no one to guide me when I was in UG, no, I'd be wrong because 
I was reluctant to approach any persons once I was completed by UG, but thankfully, somehow, due to my aspiration to become a structural engineer, I have become one as of now. So do keep your goals straight, just in case if you are planning to do a pursue your, your masters in abroad, or or I'll tell you one more thing. Let's say if you are if you are afraid because you cannot. Yeah, be a structural engineer. Don't be like that. You can become one. Even you can start from the scratch. Even now, you can become one, guys. Structural engineer, transportation. Again, civil engineering is the only field where number of masters is like very high numbers. Even for the electrical and mechanical department, they won't have this much specialization for the masters. Again, if you are planning to do an ab uh, masters in abroad. Uh, you know, do consult with your seniors or I'd be happy to help you uh, for, the, for the master's part. And for any guidance part, do ask your professors to keep your goals right. So time will run, guys. Again, as I've said, this is important slides. Uh, because I would have uh, I don't know, wished for those kind of advice during my UG. That's why I gave it this. Again, this ends my overall entire presentation. Thank you. Thank you all. So, yes, thank you, Prashant. Uh, I request uh, Bharat Valverasan to give his feedback and order thanks. Oh, sorry, uh, any sure. questions? Uh, Richin has actually asked a question, right? Uh, Richin, can you unmute and ask your question? Uh, yes, sir. So, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, go on. So, while you uh, while you were presenting, I saw a picture like you were showing uh, these reinforcement bars being stressed before being placed into the mold. So are these tendons uh, even stressed before positioning it in the mold uh, prior to concreting? If you uh, that that's the pre-stress uh, pre-tensioning. If you if you uh, I think that's what you are talking about. If you're gonna stress your tendons before the pouring of the concrete, it's pre-tensioning. If you're Again, the tendons will be placed inside the, the molds. That's that's the thing common for the both pre and post tensioning. In case of pre tensioning, your tendons will be stressed before pouring up the concrete. Am I clear? No, actually, I saw a picture in your okay. presentation, like uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay. two bars were alone. Like, is it is it uh, in the beginning? It, in the beginning it was in the beginning. Okay. No, if you're talking about this. No, 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 no. Oh, you're right. real time. You're showing the real time picture, yeah. Mm -mm -mm. This? No, 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 no. Okay, okay. No, Stop no. me. Pre-tensioning ends here. No. This one? No, 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 no. Okay. Um, yeah, let's see. I believe then it should be under this construction sequence. Let's see. This one? No. No, no it was in the very beginning, like in the first 10 yeah. minutes or so. Right. Okay, I'll go to. I'll, Again, I'll change it slowly. Stop me. Yeah, this one. This is pre-tensioning. No, no. Uh, can you go again? Again, you want forward, me? Forward. Yeah, yeah, downwards, downwards. Downwards, yeah. Downwards, down, 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 down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. This is pre-tensioning, okay, pre-tensioning. Uh, so you want me to go further down? Or, I mean, forward? <laughs> no, I think, no, I, I felt like I saw one, you know, like a uh, stirrups. Stirrup. Something like a V-shape, V-bent bars. It was just like a place outside. Not inside a mold or something. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, you're talking about the slab, construction of a slab? Slabs? 
no 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 okay fine fine i'll go i'll go through the entire thing and we are talking about a real real time pick right Okay, real time pick starts from here this one no 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 it's all right okay i'll just i don't know <laughs> fine 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 let me let me scroll through the entire part no uh, what i actually saw was like uh, these tendons were even uh, these reinforcement bars or tendons oh. they were placed outside the mold and you mm -hmm. told like uh, these are pre tension bars so i thought how uh, are they uh, tension before placing inside the mold itself or what? Mm -hmm. i was thinking that i uh, the question came up okay the it ends here actually yeah right again uh, okay whatever be the picture was let me make myself clear again the pre stressing why it is called as pre stressing it is you are inducing the stress before the concrete has been put into service uh, that is pre stressing pre tension because you are uh, you are tensioning the tendons before you pour the concrete post tension because you are tensioning the tendons after you pour the concrete that's what the entire concept is okay, okay. so is it right yeah, okay okay bro thank you fine 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 Again. yes uh, any other questions Uh, okay then uh, i request bharat valvarasan to give the, uh, give the feedback and word of thanks sir thank you for this wonderful webinar sir it's very informative and uh, we got a clear idea about uh, uh, pre tensioning and the steps involved in it sir but to the topics like uh, job of pre structural engineer and uh, punching shear construction sequence are very interesting so you got a clear knowledge about that sir and uh, thank you for sparing your time and uh, making this one hour very useful for us sir. thank you sir thank you yeah. thank you thank you bharat and uh, thank you prashant it was a wonderful session so because it had uh, more of pictures i am sure that all the students uh, it would have been very easy for them to understand so yeah. that's what is required and the two real time pictures were good and so thank you once again so coming back okay. and uh, interacting and also giving the tips sure. on uh, career also yeah hoping that we'll have more alumni interaction like that and uh, thank you uh, i thank hod also for uh, helping in all this and supporting so yeah thank you prashant okay thank you thank you thank you thank you all thank you thank you students uh, so in the chat box i have given the feedback link for the participants so students please fill the feedback also thank you thank you thank you prashant thank you ma'am